Good afternoon and welcome to the Sustainable Materials Management Webinar Series, a joint effort between the National Recycling Coalition and the Pennsylvania Recycling Market Center. My name is Wayne Bowen. And I'm the program manager for the Market Center and will serve as your moderator today. We'd like to extend a special thanks to Bob Hollis of the Mobius Network for providing the webinar management software for this series, and Lisa Ruggiero and Savannah Batowski of the National Recycling Coalition for assisting the RMC with webinar promotion and technical support. Today's webinar focus is on commercial recycling. Our presenter today is Dr. Lisa Skumatz, who I will introduce in a moment. Following her presentation, we will conduct a question and answer session. If you have a question or comment, please use the GoToWebinar dialog box located in the control panel on your screen. You may also use the dialog box to request assistance if you're experiencing technical difficulties during the webinar. Please note that an edited version of this webinar will be made available for viewing via YouTube links on the National Recycling Coalition and PA Recycling Market Center websites. Now I'd like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Lisa Skumatz is an economist and principal of SERA, Inc. She has a nationwide reputation in integrated planning, program evaluation, rates and revenue options, economic and policy analysis, and scenario analysis and forecasting for solid waste agencies. Her interests include both quantitative and policy issues and focuses on how facilities and programs work in the real world. She maintains Sarah's comprehensive in-house databases of programs, policies, costs, performance, and other data for more than 1,300 communities across the U.S. and 9,000 plus pay-as-you-throw communities in the United States and solid waste initiatives and programs in all 50 states and internationally. Dr. Skumatz has talk, taught solid waste integrated planning and evaluation workshops in California, Washington, Oregon, Colorado, the UK, and elsewhere. She's a member of numerous national, state, local, civic, environmental, professional, economic, and waste management and recycling organizations. She's on the board of the National Recycling Coalition, the NRC, the CAFR, the Rocky Mountain Chapter of SWANA. Lisa has won two national awards for lifetime achievement from NRC and National SWANA and Colorado's Lifetime Achievement Award for quantitative work in solid waste. She has also served as an elected official in Colorado. Okay, Dr. Skumatz, I'm going to turn the program over to you. Thank you so much. So the focus today is commercial recycling. What are the drivers? What are the challenges? And what are some solutions? What have communities found that, that are working? Well, let's see why it's not moving forward. There we go. The topics that we'll cover include providing a little bit of context for why one would even consider moving into the commercial sector. Um, some tips on how to understand the sector. Um, what what can you do to totally to to understand a better handle on what the sector needs, does, and so on, and some some tips for that. Some barriers that both the traditional barriers and some barriers that I think people find surprising, and some ways to address some of those non-traditional barriers. Then I'll talk about some of the motivators for the sector and provide um, a review of a number of commercial initiatives that communities have found helpful. So first, context: Why even consider entry into the com into the commercial waste sector? Well, number one, because it's 40 to 60 percent of the waste stream, and it's very hard to consider um, being able to reach goals. In a community, if you if you ignore 40 to 60 percent of the waste stream, um, it's if your if your citywide goal is 50 percent, and your and and let's say that commercial sector is 50 percent of the waste stream, if you don't touch commercial and and you don't and there's very little going on, then that would mean you'd have to approach something like 100 percent recycling in the residential sector, which is pretty un, unrealistic. So it's if you were if you're uh, goal is citywide or whatever, this is a really important sector to hit. It also can make a big bang, 50%. You may have fewer actors that, that com comprise a really big chunk of that commercial sector waste stream, depending on where you where you are, what your local economy is like, and so on. So you can get a, re a big bang by hitting several smaller act or smaller number of actors. It's low cost to you. 
if you're if you are a city or a county or whatever and you put in some mandates or requirements or service requirements or something you you're not bearing that cost it's generators and so from a purely selfish point of view it can be a pretty low cost item because it's rare that the that the recycling programs in the commercial sector are provided by the city unlike what happens in the residential sector it's a few key streams. It's not like the commercial sector is a mystery. You know, there are there are a few things that that make up the bulk of what's generated in this sector. You know, paper is a big one. That's not shocking. Um, con containers can be a big one, um, and um, oh, organics is a big one. Cardboard is a big one. So there are a few key streams that really um, you need to focus on for this sector, and it's perhaps a little bit less diverse than, than what we see in, in the residential sector, at least at the um, um, consumer level. Job creation um, benefits can be achieved and greenhouse gas benefits are achieved, whether it's residential or commercial recycling um, that's, that's stepped up. And um, there are a number of reasons to consider um, improving things like program access and, and some programs can make it uh, better aesthetics in the community as well. So you can achieve a whole variety of different goals when you're considering moving into the um, commercial waste sector. And the why not is is a number of things, uh, various kinds of barriers. Yes, it's 40 to 60 percent of the waste stream. Yes, you could jumpstart recycling um, that's stagnated on the residential side by moving in this sector, and the costs are borne elsewhere. Commercial is considered to be quite homogeneous, but I think it's not as homogeneous, or it's considered um, very heterogeneous. It's not homogeneous, that's for sure, but I think it's not as heterogeneous as people think. It's not so diverse, it's not so different. You can, you can tailor an approach based on sizes of businesses. So there's a chunk of small businesses, a chunk of medium businesses that are pretty diverse and some really large businesses. So a tailored approach hitting maybe some of the, the, the largest businesses and then um, a, a quite quite homogeneous small group could, could hit a, a big chunk of the sector. As I mentioned, the materials aren't that many and you can tailor the approach and on for the priority sizes or materials. Um, it can be very um, cost effective and um, while there, but there are issues, there are many players, and it's and your authorities may also be limited. The many players include, you know, it if there are, um, you want to intervene with builders and developers because otherwise you've lost opportunities for diverting waste that gets gets a lot of waste that gets generated once every 80 or 100 or however many years the the building is in place. Commercial um, managers and uh, um, they. And, and haulers are very active in this field, recycling businesses, and the city and county all have roles in this in this field, which is a little bit different from what happens in the residential sector where things are much more um, one uniform. So how can you get to know your local sector? Oh my gosh, that's that could be tricky. You could say, well, first cut, I know that papers, you know, I know there are offices everywhere, and I know paper's a main material, and I know cardboard's a main material, and, and so maybe I just go from there. Maybe I can leverage, though, because there's existing data, data from nearby communities I might be able to apply to my community. You also could be doing surveys. Surveys are, I think, um, a, a pretty great way to try to find out what are the big bang items, what are the needs and practices, what are people already recycling, what are they? What what do they need next? What are the barriers they see? That's something that you can you can you do, and you can do it pretty cost effectively if you use sampling approaches, and you don't need thousands of respondents. You 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 really don't. The, the sampling um, can tell you a lot about a sector with as few sample um, with as few surveys as 68 with with quite a bit of variation, but you can get responses from say 270 without a big deal, and that could be that could. On, on the whole, on average, that could represent that could provide you plus or minus five percent at ninety percent confidence for a lot of the um, up for for the questions in that survey. You could then angle even more information out of it by doing a waste composition study or at least a drive-by study, giving you some idea of what kinds of materials are actually being put out. Put out that that composition study can give you a lot of information. If you say get a do a a, a bigger mail or web survey. And then use a sub select from the subsample of those and do a waste composition study. That can give you some really great leverageable information. 
in that survey, you could also make sure and gather information on the activities, the behaviors, the practices, their needs, their problems, and so on and so forth. That information could get you a lot of, a lot of data to try to target and tailor programs. Well, that may seem a little scary. Surveys certainly shouldn't seem too scary, but that waste composition thing can be pretty scary They're, and expensive. But there are waste compositions from a number of other cities and states, and that's pretty cheap to you. Um, I, I have seen a lot of data from around the country showing waste compositions for either the commercial sector at large or much better, waste composition data providing you matrices of the commercial waste composition by NAICS code or NAICS code grouping. For those of you who are of my generation, it used to be called SIC codes, but it's business classifications, the retail trade, the wholesale sector, blah, 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 restaurants, and so on. So they have inf like columns of information that give you the waste comp for that sector. It exists. There's data from all of uh, it's been collected as ba far back as 1999. Um, I will say that there's a pretty strong study that, that was just released in 2014 in California. And I think on this slide or the next slide, I have a link, a, a link for that. Um, it gives that one in California in particular is really great because it gives you not just disposal, which was a lot, what a lot of um, these waste compositions give you, but instead it gives you generation and diversion and disposal. Generation may be quite, quite applicable um, uh, around the country. The diversion may or may not be the same and the diversion may, disposal may or may not be the same based on how active your commercial sector is relative to what they have in California. In most cases, I'm guessing that California has been more active than many areas. So at least the generation part of it gives you some really good uh, information that you can use to say, oh, well, we think, you know, we, we, we know what's generated. We know what's out there that, that could be um, approachable by our, progr our targeted programs. You can match that then, that waste composition column for, you know, SIC code 42. You can match that with your local employment figures for SIC code 42, and that gives you, that starts to get you to, to how much information, how much you're generating of different kinds of materials. But the big problem is the next thing. You not only need to know the waste comp and the number of employees, but you also need to know the tons per employee. That data looking in the literature can be all over the map. And I'm just going to say, that based on the numbers that we did here for a client uh, not long ago, depending on which, which information we use for tons per employee, um, we got that the commercial sector was anywhere from 26% to 78% of the waste stream. So you can see that it, that information is a critical and weak link in the, in the data. There is recent data, I think, that the Cal new California study has been much more rigorous about how it goes about calculating that tons per employee and um, I think we've been getting much better information. This is the information, here's the study, it was the Cal Recycles 2014 generation-based characterization of commercial sector disposal and diversion. You can see that it really matters which sector you're talking about. Anywhere, we generate anywhere from 0.36 or, or less up to 2.83 tons, tons per employee per year, um, depending on what, what sector you're in. So multiplying those pieces together gets you a, at least a proxy locally tailored based on your employment figures um, a piece of data on what is the waste stream generated in the commercial sector. So that's, a, that's one area to, to go about um, looking for um, information on the sector that's pretty darn cheap. It's a, um, we have a model set up to do that. I'm sure others can construct them as well. Um, to, we used information like that to figure out, okay, who, which sectors are delivering the, the most traditional recyclables. And we found the top four were delivering 64% of the traditional recyclables. So we knew that we could focus our, our programs on certain subsectors. For food, it was uh, four, five groups generated 68% of that. For compostables, 72% were generated by four actors, and so on and so forth. And overall, the overall materials, we found four sectors in this particular county were responsible for generating 83% of the waste in the community. So it's, it's pretty powerful stuff, even from information that you can get um, and calculate for, your, for yourself. Surveys can give you really great information as well, including information about the, what's generated most, what's their major activity, which gives you implications for what kind of um, uh, waste stream there is. Surveys can also tell you about um, large firms versus small firms, um, what's recycled most, least, what they want next for their for their programs, and um, 
um, how whether whether solid waste is a big or small part of the operating budget, so whether it even reaches their radar screen or the radar screen of their bosses or their bosses' bosses. Um, is decision making local? That's a big driver for whether or not you're going to be able to make anything happen um, at the local level. So you can get a lot of information from a survey and from a waste comp, either your own or a generated or a proxy waste comp for your particular community to understand the sector to give you an idea of up opportunities and barriers. What are the barriers? What holds commercial sector recycling back? Well, there's a number of things that we get from traditional surveys. We often hear that they don't have space for recycling, that they have to have screening requirements that are a barrier, so on and so forth. On the generator side, other barriers include things like recycling is optional and the cost is more than trash only. The other problem is that you've got um, the generator is not the person who pays the bill in many cases, and so that 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 incentive and that that behavior um, causes a, um, a a barrier as well. Management could be disinterested, could be not local. There's a hassle factor involved, and in a lot of for a lot of businesses, the main thing is making sure that there's no risk that the trash will not be collected, and so they don't want to rock the boat with whatever system they've got going now. And so that's that's a really big uh, barrier. There's training and retraining as, as staff turn over and making sure that the staff can know what the recycling pro, um, procedures are for the for the business or the organics procedures. On the city side, the concerns are that it's a heterogeneous sector. They may not have the authority. It's politically a, a not pleasant football in some cases. They have a full plate, and besides, the market is working. And so um, I don't I don't want to. Um, worry about that. I, I don't want to mess it up. But as I mentioned before, I think it's not so heterogeneous. It really is, you know, small, medium, large, or several key materials. And uh, and I do think that there are issues about what is your authority. But I think that there are some um, uh, things that, that, the, that the city or the county or the state can do or can get involved in um, that you can solve. You can maybe mandate things like space for recycling and other. You can do some things like that. But others, and particularly the barriers related to cost, are something that are very difficult for the city to solve. But I should say that based on some um, research that we did not long ago, it turns out that there are some barriers that are not so usually recognized. We have the usual suspects. Those are the ones that people look first to, to solve. But in fact, there are invoicing and contracting barriers and knowledge gaps that are levers that you can possibly um, take a role on. So what we found was that in um, in the commercial sector, the invoicing is unclear and the contracts are very restrictive in, in ways that make it difficult to, to change um, service, change provider, or, or make other, um, or, or get services that help make sure that they have the right size of, of service. You may be able to deal with that. The situation is though that adding recycling is rarely cheaper. I will say that when we did some surveys in in um, one particular for one particular client, I was surprised to learn. You know, those of us who work in the field for a long time, I was surprised to learn that when we interviewed hauler, um, businesses, businesses said, "Oh, you mean the same guy that collects my trash could also collect my recycling?" It seems unfathomable that we that we might realize that, but in fact, that was the case in you know in a number of responses. The other situation is that invoices exist, and the invoices are, I'm going to say, I'm going to say, purposely unclear. If I were a hauler, I would also be purposefully unclear. It's the same kind of thing that we see when you, you know, at Christmas time, you want a, a shop for um, a, a piece of electronics. And the model number that it's listed on at Best Buy is a different model number than it's at Target, than it is at Sears, than it is at whatever, so that you can't easily shop, comparison shop. Well, in this case, invoices have codes that are not easily translatable by the business owner who doesn't spend his time um, worrying about trash as their sole thing. And so there'll be a code that makes no sense to anybody other than the hauler who knows his secret code. So you can't say, oh, I'm getting, you know, um, a, a four yard or three times a week and also I have recycling of this size. They don't, they go out there, they don't know what size those bins are. They can't call around and say, what would you charge me? 
what would you charge me? What would you charge me? So it's, it's a business savvy and sensible thing to do, but it also makes it very difficult for businesses to say, to get the advantage of getting a new bid to say, I've got trash now. What would you charge me for trash and recycling? Or would you come and, you know, they can't do that just simply. They instead have to get someone to come out, look at their service, see what the right sizes ought to be, and make the bid then. So it's one extra step that makes things uh, more difficult. The taxes and fees and relative costs are often unclear on the invoices, so they don't realize that, in fact, they might be able to save money or at least not pay a lot more if they recycled more and, and did trash, uh, less trash. The contracts have clauses that encourage continuing the relationship. Um, they, they may say that you have to state that you want to you know, um, withdraw from this, this contract uh, 90 days in advance, and if you don't meet that window, you're in for another year or whatever. There are many contracts that have clauses like that. And businesses do not want to change unless there's a problem. They're just very risk averse about, about service. The other thing is once services start, the business may change their operations, but the, but the amount of service that they get rarely, um, rarely gets changed because the haulers have no incentive to right size less. That they want to just keep doing the same routing, the same services, and so on because that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and the business itself, in many cases, the, the um, people who are paying the bills and contracting for the service are not the same people who are putting the trash and the recyclings in the bin and see whether it's full, not full, partly full, overflowing, or whatever. So it's, there's real inertia there that causes a lack of a maximizing of recycling and a minimizing of the bills that, that people pay. Um, the contract elements are, you know, deal with things like automatic renewals, cancel and stop conditions, and so on. They also include things like exclusive right to serve and right of first refusal. So if you do get another bid and the bid is better, you may have to stick with the guy that you've got with, you know, a, a chance to, to revise the cost. But, you know, it's not, it's not um, a, a super responsive um, uh, way to, it's, it's, it's not built to encourage recycling and change and, and updating. When we asked the customers about their, any issues they had with contracts and invoices, the majority reported no problems. But of course, that would be the case because if there'd been a lot of problems, they would have probably gone to another hauler. But in any case, we do find that some of the barriers that they did um, address were, I wanted to cancel, but I couldn't, or I missed the automatic renewal, and I was stuck. Um, those sorts of things are barriers that they, that they find. Um, they couldn't switch the level, those sorts of things. These are the kinds of barriers that, that customers do find. What cities can do is cities can put out information encouraging city um, businesses in town to bid for new service. There are a lot of advantages to doing that, and it's not very hard to do. It really, you know, come look at my at my business, see what I'm getting now, look at how overflowing or not, and give me a price. It's it's not that hard. The the um, hauler is a professional; they can figure out what kinds of service levels the business might be, but might need by looking at the service make them aware of options, and help them realize savings in the bill. They may be able to um, get better service, more recycling service for a lower cost if they've been massively oversubscribing to service in the condition that they're in now. There may also be joint services and economies um, if they um, use the same hauler, of course, for, for certain um, for the services, and that's not something all people do. The main thing is that the, that businesses are really unaware. They are risk averse too, but they're unaware, and cities can really educate to provide to get to better service and potentially increase recycling with something as simple as getting people to bid and encouraging them strongly to bid as a as a package of trash and recycling. You can also we also find that in many cases there weren't any contracts, and where they had contracts, they were pretty. Um, difficult to get out of change uh, and so on. Um, you could do a media blitz, have some sample documents, and um, also maybe put some things in to a uh, language that suggests periodic waste audits and right sizing, um, hauler notice on bills about recycling, and a number of other of the kinds of things that you can make a difference in the commercial sector with a simple program of of this nature that addresses invoicing, contracts, and bidding. One of the other things I wanted to talk about a little bit was some survey work we did to try to figure out motivations for who, what moves commercial recycling forward and what moves communities also to move into the field, the area of recycling, um, uh, commercial sector recycling. We did, we 
gathered information from um, uh, a lot of communities around the country um, with populations anywhere from 5,000 to a million. We got information on their com commercial collection and authority, recycling access, processing, local conditions like facilities, tip fees, how close they are to, to, to ports and what kind of programs and policies they put in, pl in place and information about their waste stream. We looked at all kinds of factors that might drive which communities um, put in recycling, um, recycling in the commercial sector, which had moved in that direction. We looked at whether or not they had goals, what their authority was, and how, whether it was available, currently you know, invoked or not, whether, what the hauler situation was, one, many, uh, contracts, not contracts, and so on, political support, and a number of other things, some of the big drivers that we would have thought would be important. <coughs> Excuse me, I am an economist, so for me it would be mostly about tip fees and about costs and about closeness to markets and that sort of thing. But when we statistically analyzed where cities had made things happen, it was things, um, it, it wasn't landfill shortage, it wasn't disposal of tip fees, <coughs> it was whether or not a goal had been established by the town, whether or not they'd had substantial progress already in the residential sector and were therefore sort of ready to move to the next sector. One of the other things was activist staff. Staff has a big role in figuring out what, count, what goes in front of council and therefore what council implements. Um, staff who are activists, who are um, persistent and other things can make a lot happen. Having been on a town board for 10 years, I can, I can say with great assurance that um, uh, if something comes before you a lot of times, or if it comes it comes before you with enthusiasm, that's something that gets your attention, and that's and and so city staff can make a lot happen. One of the other things, excuse me, one of the other things I wanted to talk about were some of the strategies that we see. So what are some commercial initiatives that have um, ha that we can look at as possible strategies in our in our communities? We used the survey work that we talked about a moment ago, talking to different communities about what kinds of programs were in place to break to put them into different categories. Those categories were sort of basic starting steps and outreach programs, and that included things like you know um, establishing committees, doing basic outreach info and tips, having you know websites and that sort of thing, setting goals for businesses or haulers that weren't um, that maybe were or were not enforced, reporting service requirements requiring recycling plans of businesses, requiring um, suggesting that clauses be put into um, uh, lease agreements or um, requiring recycling, requiring space for recycling in, in building codes. Basic things like grants, technical assistance, awards and recognition programs. Those were kind of our first category of programs. <coughs> the next category included things like it, it, things that addressed incentives and it access. Those could include incentives for the haulers, business incentives related to pay as you throw, tip fees and surcharges that, that get put on to change the economics of disposal versus diversion, um, requirements to offer recycling or compost service, and some specialized small business initiatives. Bans and mandates, it's hard to tell the difference between, it, the effective difference between a ban and a mandatory mandate, um, a landfill ban and a mandate. I think that there are some there's some difference, but um, they they are meant to get at the same kind of thing, and so you could have it for some or all, um, and uh, it be based on size or type of business or based on material we're talking about. There are sort of policies related to construction and demolition, related to procurement, related to recycled con recycled content, and things like contract municipalization and and collection changes. Those are a variety of policies that can make a big difference also in the, com in the commercial landscape. Infrastructure included public-private partnerships, hub and spoke, exchanges, <coughs> and cooperatives are other things that communities have put in place. When we asked about what were the most, when we looked at what were most commonly reported in the surveys for what had been implemented, the number one thing in the commercial sector were things like outreach, tips, trying to do tracking, and setting some goals. The next most common strategies were selected recycling mandates, saying that one particular business may 
um, have to do recycling or those over a certain size. Requirements to offer service for some sectors, some basic C&D um, outreach programs or requirements to have um, a recycling bin alongside a trash bin at all C&D sites. Grants, technical assistance, and recognition programs were particularly um, uh, noted, and some small business programs, most often things like ha providing bins for um, recycling that were just like the um, the residential bins. What were uncommonly reported were things like special fees, hub and spoke, bans were not one of the most commonly reported things, um, nor were market development and other things. When we looked at how how um, commercial strategies were kind of implemented over time and in different sort of levels of aggressiveness, we find that you know the most the sort of first level of attack is you know, community preparation, research, goals, and identifying authorities and what a town can and cannot do. The next phase starts providing information and goals and ordinances around haulers and businesses and providing information. The next level starts with incentives, business incentives, technical assistance and recognition, grants, and that sort of thing. The next step, step starts looking at partnerships for programs and facilities and paying real attention to small businesses. When you start getting um, more uh, start going after really big tons and some town costs, we start seeing phase five, bans, mandates, targeted streams or sectors, and requirements with enforcement. And finally, policies that move to, toward the future um, and frameworks for net zero and, and content standards and, and market development and so on are things that we see as sort of the highest um, strategies we've seen in communities around the country. Which programs pr reportedly perform best? The communities reported that they said mandates and bans enforced were, report were reportedly quite effective. One of the things that I wanted to mention is that you know when you've got a mandate or a ban and there's there's requirements for everybody to participate, then economies of scale can really help the cost. It's a level playing field in that case also. Everybody is playing under the same rules. It's a new system and um, and although it's politically complex, studies we've done and, and research we've conducted showed that, you know, if you include, if you had a, a set of programs that included mandates and bans, it, you would achieve something like 11 to 30 times as many tons per dollar spent at the city level. Um, and you, so why not spend your political capital on programs that are really effective? So either the residential side or the commercial side, looking at including a a, a significant share of mandates and bans, and not just the usual suspect type programs like a little education outreach and and a few incentives and so on, you'll get a much, much, much bigger um, bang for the buck if you really seriously look at mandates and bans. They were they were reportedly effect, um, effective from the survey respondents. <clears throat> financial incentives um, motivate and maintain change. So financial incentives that are aligned with your goals. Could really, can really make a difference, whether that's incentives to haulers or incentives to businesses. Usually it's incentives um, to uh, haulers related to tip fees and so on. It can also be franchise fee, or sorry, uh, goals, payments for reaching goals and so on. Make sure they're aligned with your goals, not things that will let people do some shoulder behavior that's not really what you want, but, but it sort of met, met what seemed like your goal. <clears throat> and design for the social optimum, rather than saying you'll Okay, we'll provide incentives if you achieve 50% recycling from every business in your on your route. It's actually cheaper to say we'd like to see 50% from the combined businesses on your route, and then if it happens that they can get 75% from a few biz, big firms, if a ton is a ton in your goal or a ton is a ton in your tracking system, then that is actually a cheaper and and more effective way, a socially optimal way to get those tons. If, however, a ton is a ton is not a ton, and you care more about certain kinds of materials, then then your goals and your financial incentives need to be crafted in order to motivate that change. Change is unlikely cheaper, and that's one of the biggest things that I think is really important to recognize. We tell we tell everybody a story that oh, you might save if you recycle more and you have less trash, but in fact, given that 80% or more of the cost is getting another 
truck to the door, you have to save some phenomenal amounts of trash in order to save save overall money, unless you're in places with very high tip fees. When you're in Colorado or the Rocky Mountains and your tip fees are on the order of $15 a ton, it's a pretty hard sell to say you're going to have a cheaper rate. The the cost of collection swamps that that uh, any savings you might get. That's not the same case in perhaps some of the coasts or the more urban areas. So that's a local uh, situation. Education and outreach? Question mark. People like those. It's popular and often recommended. <clears throat> but none of the research that we've done has showed that it's a really cost-effective strategy. And the behavior change is not necessarily as retained as something that's reinforced by economic pocketbook incentives. Education and outreach may, will, will resonate well with the people who already believe and are already um, bought into it. Their behavior is not likely to change a lot. If you're going to do education and outreach, you need to do education and outreach in a way that doesn't just inform people, but provides motivation, gets rid of barriers, comes from trusted sources, and the other sort of tenets of social marketing and other, other kinds of really effective outreach. Funding sources are also really important to explore. <clears throat> and you can, you know, cities often don't have a lot of funds. You can require education, perhaps, as a part of being licensed to provide service in the area. Um, those are the sorts of things that you can also look at. When we're talking about education, one of the things we did was ask businesses what it is that they would <clears throat> they would see as valuable information. They they um, lunch and learns not a big sell. Recycling hotline not a big sell. Website not very much paid paid attention to, but things like a list of service providers with contact information valuable. Frequently asked questions valuable. Case studies of your business type, valuable. General information, not so much. Um, <clears throat> when we asked about sample, sample contracts and that sort of thing, that was also valuable. So I want to talk a little bit about some leading commercial strategies to consider and give you some that I think are some really uh, nice examples. <clears throat> Number one, and, and sort of a bullet and a star um, I give to Vermont, which put in some great legislation that required a <clears throat> a progressive change in in the way that solid waste is handled and required to be handled in the state. Since we're talking about commercial, I wanted to, to circle some of the things that were particularly valuable or particularly targeted at the commercial sector in this plan. <clears throat> in the first year of the five-year plan, food scrap generators of 104 tons per year must divert materials to any certified facility within 20 miles. And I know that other states in the area put in um, similar legislation, I don't mean, but, but Vermont kind of started this trend. Sorry about that for others from those other states who might be online. Um, year two, recyclables have become banned from the landfill. <clears throat> that, and food scrap generators of a smaller size must divert materials. In year three, we're talking about yard waste materials banned from the landfill, and we're talking about a lower threshold again on the, on the food scraps folks. Finally, in year, in year four, food scrap threshold drops, and in year five, food scraps become banned from the landfill. These are kind of things that are going to affect the um, commercial sector in a big, dramatic, and low cost to the city kind of way. So these, if, if you could be as politically astute or however Vermont got this legislation in place, yay, you could make a huge difference. On the, and, and many of these affect the residential sector as well, as you can see the ones that I haven't circled. <clears throat> Another thing to consider is, you know, pay, as you know, we've done a lot of work looking at pay-as-you-throw and trying to figure out um, um, the effectiveness of pay-as-you-throw on the residential side. Well, it turns out if you want to have, you know, um, another very effective program is looking at embedded recycling to make pay-as-you-throw on the business side. The, the trick is, you know, yes, I know that businesses pay based on the amount of trash, the number of collections, the volume, the, that sort of thing, the frequency, the number of containers, and so on. That is volume-based payment. I understand that. <clears throat> but the difference for the residential side versus the commercial side is the residential side, that's, that's usually paired with no extra cost for recycling. That's not the case in the, on the business side, and that is the barrier that moves them um, to, be, to having a similar program that, that really is pay, pay-as-you-throw in a way that the residential side is pay-as-you-throw. <clears throat> so what cities who put this in place have done is require to have you know, volume-based rates um, on the trash side, but that it must also embed the cost of a certain amount of recycling as part of that trash, um, as a ratio of that trash service, 
with no separate charge. Some cities have selected 50%. <clears throat> so if you have, you know, one cubic or two cubic yards of trash, you'd have to have a half, um, one cubic yard of, of recycling offered with the cost embedded in that trash bill. It can also be equal to the trash service or 150% of the trash service. And if you want to have, if you want to try to achieve goals that are greater than 50%, you have to have that you would have to have this ratio as a number greater than 100% um, in recycling because otherwise the math doesn't work. Um, <clears throat> because of funny sizes and because of small generators and so on, um, they usually requ require that the minimum recycling size that's given to the business be 96 gallons. This is, the critical difference is this removes the recycling cost barrier. It does not cost more to recycle than it does to do trash only. <clears throat> It, so it limits the risk and cost to haulers also because you're not saying, as you do on the res site, virtually, that you know you, you get a 96-gallon container, but you can have another one and another one or whatever for those rare people who use more than one um, recycling container. Here, by making a limit of 50%, 100%, or 150%, or whatever number that you choose, you're not saying unlimited recycling for that cost, but rather you're, you're limiting it, you're limiting the risk for the haulers. <clears throat> This is what makes it parallel to, re to the residential pay as you throw program. It's used in Seattle and a number of other cities. Um, and I should note that also one of the things that, that Seattle has done is also uh, uh, contracting for, for service as well, but we'll talk more about that as, as we move forward. Another of my favorite law, um, rules or laws <clears throat> is the ABC law. This is in place in North Carolina, and I think a number of other communities have adopted it as well. And <clears throat> It's, it's a, it targets particular materials and it includes an enforcement element. Businesses defined in various ways. Businesses with food and, and, and bars or restaurants or, or what it really boils down to is businesses with liquor licenses have to recycle their beverage containers or they face non-renewal of their liquor license. Well, it piggybacks on an existing enforcement mechanism which is really attractive. You don't have to set up a new, a new system. It's targeted at businesses with significant containers. And when you have a, an enforcement mechanism as valuable as a liquor license, you can bet that compliance is nearly universal. It's been a very successful program in, in that state and, and in other places it's been put in place. Other options to consider, differential surcharges. There are some counties that have established substantial taxes or fees on trash, but exclude or forgive or forgive um, sales taxes or other things on recycling or organics to try to change relative prices. It moves the cost of trash up. It moves the co um, but, you know those surcharges move the cost of trash up, and to either <clears throat> leave recycling and organics the same or reduce them in some degree, but it definitely changes the relative prices. It may help make the addition of recycling and diversion um, um, at a facility um, more cost effective for some businesses. We did some statistical work looking at communities that, counties that or business uh, um, behavior in communities that did, in communities that did have this kind of tax differential, large tax differential and small differentials or no differentials. And we found that the uptake of organics in particular was three times as high in the areas that did have substantial um, price differentials chain affected by these um, surcharges and, dis and uh, tax, uh, sales tax reductions. So it can make a difference. Some of the other things that can be considered, and, and we spoke a little bit about it, were bans and mandates, universal recycling ordinances, and targeted um, programs. Bans, including Vermont's progressive bans, um, putting those in place can have a big impact on what happens with tons. As I mentioned, significantly greater diversion when you've got <clears throat> bans in place. You can have mandates for offering recycling, <clears throat> but unless the underlying economics <clears throat> is already there, we usually find there's maybe 10 to 20 percent uptake of, of those programs. So um, if, you, if you're just saying sh people should offer recycling, don't expect there to be a dramatic effect on the number of participants. The tons that will be diverted will be a bit higher than 10 to 20 percent because the people that will tend to participate will tend to be those with the most uh, material to recycle or the most interest, the most effective recyclers and so on. You can have requirements to, to provide um, 
to to pay for recycling. I, I already talked about to offer recycling, but here we're talking about mandates to provide the service to everybody and make them pay for that recycling. That's that's effectively the same as a mandate for recycling. That can be done sector wide or um, have requirements for businesses at service thresholds. So, for instance, we saw the Vermont law started with 104 cubic yards, scaling down to ultimately all food waste had to be collected. This could be a service threshold that maybe starts at um, a higher, a high number of cubic yards and ratchets down over time. You can have a universal recycling ordinance requiring recycling or organics for all sectors, or targeted to certain businesses that are the big generators of that sector of that of that material. I already mentioned that bans are more effective per dollar spent by the city, and it makes a huge difference in what you're what you're going to achieve at the end of the at the end of the day. For when you're talking about material bans, one of the big questions is how are you going to enforce it? And enforcement is a big, complicated, and varied problem. We've seen a lot of variation in how the how um, these program how bans are enforced. One of the things that we've uh, seen is you know you can you can sort at the curb, or you can look for um, uh, um, materials that are disallowed. At the curb, you can look out of the truck, you can go to the transfer station or the landfill. We usually see sorts happening at the transfer station and landfill. And they're usually looking for some threshold. If the banned material is more than 10% of the load or something, then they get rejected. They get fined an additional amount. They get sent back to the line or be forced to separate it out. We see a number of different kinds of enforcement um, and penalties. I will say that one of my favorite, um, and, and those situations um, are often random sorts. Um, um, are sometimes used and sometimes um, it's it's just if it's egregious then they pull it aside. Of course, reporting is also um, you know people ratting out um, businesses or others is another way it's it's enforced. I I should say my favorite example was a a, a state that was doing random and random checks at at transfer stations and landfills, and they publicized um, they wanted to get more. Um, compliance and more attention to the program. So they publicized the people who did not meet the requirements, the commercial businesses that did not meet the requirements. And some of them were very well known and, and respected do good agencies, you know, Red Cross type agencies who had quite a, 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 a black eye from having not met requirements of the of the recycling law that was in place in that state. And that can make a, a difference as well in sort of getting more cooperation. Other strategies that you can use are for small businesses. You might arrange co-ops. If any one business um, is too small for the amount, you know, to, to have recycling collected by a by a hauler, then maybe three businesses within the same block or within a two-block area can all be putting out materials on the same day, same time, and have it all collected at once by um, a shared a shared hauler or collection. You can have free recycling containers for small businesses, the 96 gallons, and they could be collected along with the recycling program or even by commercial haulers, um, it's not a very expensive system. We've also seen communities where all businesses were asked to pay for food collection, whether or not they used it or not. That program was available. It was embedded in the trash rate um, as part of the, the system. Another thing to consider is establishing commercial contracts, much as re residential uh, can have uh, contracts as well. Some cities have implemented. They've implemented a contract. Seattle, among others, have have a contract for collection. It can be complicated because they, the the legalities around it can be um, difficult to to manage. There may be um, it may appear that there's no way to to do to get the authority to contract for service. In places where that's not the case, not available, you might be able to talk with a local with a downtown business district or a business improvement district and have have that be part of that kind of system. Um, the contracts can help, can give you a lot of authority. You can prioritize recycling. You can make the contract charge incentive-based rates. You can undertake, you know, programs to um, that you want, and you can do pay-as-you-throw with embedded recycling. So if you can get a handle on the system, if you can get um, authority, then you can provide a lot of, you know, more incentive-based rates for the businesses in that area, or a pay-as-you-throw or other kinds of things. So it's, it's very powerful if you can make that happen. Some of the simpler things that we see are grants and technical assistance. Grants can be designed to support goals, and I've seen uh, grants that or, uh, grants um, that that support um, uh, investment in internal containers or or that sort of thing. 
education web and template materials on a website can be helpful. You can provide technical assistance, and there are a number of communities in California and elsewhere who've been providing technical assistance on an as-needed or on-call basis for years um, to go into businesses and advise them on how they could be doing better on recycling and organics and how they could right size, how they could change procedures within a building, how they could do better signage and all kinds of things to get businesses up to snuff. It's not their core business to be good recyclers. It's not their core business to understand how to do it best. And that technical assistance can help solve that problem. There's a, rather than grant programs, other places have set up revolving loan funds to get those kinds of um, containers or other kinds of barriers met, um, maybe to help with uh, screen, investment in a screening that's required. A few cities um, offer things like the, if you sign up for a year's worth of, of organic service, you get the first three months paid for by the city. And so there are lots of um, one-off strategies like that. Haulers can be your partner as well. Some of the things that we um, that have been proposed in different communities include two-tier two hauler rates. If that hauler has achieved a 25% recycling goal, they get a lower rate at the, trans, at the landfill or the transfer station, or other kind, or met goals of other kinds. You can require um, service, or you can provide a lot of service requirements in hauler licensing um, requirements, and um, and I think um, I talked already about the setting the goal for the entire commercial sector or multiple businesses. Um, is better than having one um, requirement to uh, recycle, say, 50 or 75 percent from each business. But recognize that if you're going to try to affect hauler behavior, the financial incentive has to be big enough to change hauler behavior. If it's if you're offering an incentive that's less than what it's going to cost them to do, then then it's going to be a tougher sell. One of the other things I th I think um, it's useful to think about is new metrics. So we've used traditional metrics like the recycling rate or the diversion rate or the landfill diversion rate or per capita um, generation or, or diversion rate options. But the problems with some of these traditional metrics is they're not informative to tell you what, what, what you should do next. I've achieved a 40%, you know, 45% recycling goal. And whether that's in the commercial sector, the recycling center or combined um, sector, it's, it's not, it doesn't tell you, so what do I do next? How well am I doing? That 49% sounds good, but do I have a lot of recyclables left, don't I? It also doesn't reflect broader goals. A ton may not be a ton in your community. Your goals may be related to sustainability, or it may involve things like greenhouse gas, or reduction of toxics, or a million other things that may make it so that it's not just tons we're talking about. It's something beyond tons. Um, the traditional rates, like diversion rate, landfill diversion rate, they don't, they don't really reflect that difference. <clears throat> there are also data com collection complexities. I don't know about um, every state, but in some states, very few communities have, a, have asserted the authority, and the state doesn't have the authority in some cases, to require data, data reporting by haulers. And so getting data that includes both the programs and the disposal that you need to, to uh, compute a diversion rate is really hard to get with any kind of um, reliability. Not only that, trucks cross lines, whether that's residential and commercial, but especially it's across communities. So getting um, information that's that's at the right granularity, the right quality, to really help inform is, is tough. And then some of these rates are also um, sensitive to whether or not there is economic variation. And it may, and just changes in the economy can, may, may change how you're performing with no change in, in what's happening in your real recycling sector. So perhaps looking at improved metrics can give you more information that helps you inform what to do next in your commercial sector. So if you one one that um, was in an article in Resource Recycling in 2016 was uh, percent recoverables remaining. Some communities call it good stuff left. Um, and what it does is you use a waste composition and you look at the waste composition, how much material that's currently recyclable is still left in the waste. In the, what you've asked people to do is take things out of the trash and put them in the recycling bin. If they're still in the trash, then something's not working yet. And so if you look at, say, set a goal of we're looking for less than 10%, you know, combined recycling and food waste, or 10% food waste and 10% recycling. You can set some goals that are very tangible like that, and you can, you can, and that tells you, well, gosh, we're at, we're at 13% um, still left, and it's mostly uh, HTPE or something. Then you know what to target next. You're looking at that and able to make tangible next step activity actions uh, to move forward. The metric also serves more than one purpose. You can say, um, gosh, you can add a greenhouse gas factor, say take the, take the simple ratios out of, 
out of the EPA warm model, assign those to the percents that are left of the material, and say, oh my gosh, um, you know, while while there's a lot of of this material left, this one over here is is really affecting our greenhouse gas performance, and that's the one we want to target next. So you can take this information and use it at, um, in a number of ways to inform what you should be targeting for the commercial sector, what you should do next. Um, and you can link that to um, behavior, as I mentioned, and you can set up data collection, reporting, and calculation protocols. You can measure it at the curb, at the truck, at the transfer station, and so on, and set up target materials, res versus commercial, and link to requested behaviors. One of the other things that we found was very helpful in moving commercial recycling forward in one in one uh, area of the country was the the barrier we've been seeing of of not sufficient compost processing um, facilities. Ohio made some significant strides in in um, their processing infrastructure and therefore making it better access for a commercial recycling and organics by working with their state level EPA to simplify the permitting process, especially for facilities that involved processing of food scraps, which was a real target. They excluded some folks, you know, some small generators or small um, folks from the regulations, small operators from the um, operation from the regulations. They established four facility classes, one of which included food waste that was class two. So for class two, they had a three-step permitting process that was very simplified, and that's uh, something that you, your community or your state might want to look at if this is the big barrier. This is a big barrier, and I'm seeing a lot of states that are putting in very aggressive um, uh, permitting uh, requirements and, um, and operating requirements that, that are very akin to a landfill um, and, and the costs and so on are, are restricted and causing really big problems for a sector that's dying to sort of get composting out of the stream but doesn't have a place to put it. I mentioned some of those easy things that you can do provide require space for recycling in buildings that are significantly remodeled or new construction, recycling, recycling clauses in leases, or recycling plans of businesses. And those plans could be filed with the city, they could be filed with the haulers, um, and or be required to be kept on site, that sort of thing. Um, bans and mandates, as I mentioned, are harder, but if they're going to spend political capital on getting something through, certainly bans and mandates are really big, and they affect both residential and, and commercial. There are upstream things that also can really help move recycling forward. It's not specific to recycling, but procurement guidelines, market development zones, grants, you know, um, uh, requirements for use of local compost in traffic uh, or in uh, Department of Transportation things and so on. When we did some recent work for a commercial for commercial options for a county level client, I just wanted to give you an idea of sort of some of the overarching principles that we try to think about. Some of the things we think about are making sure that the incentives are designed to, to support what is really the goal of the city or the city or the county. Um, uh, and that's, you know, making that link and making sure that everything uh, pairs up um, is really important so that you don't achieve a target that's a little to the right or a little to the left of what it was you were trying to do and, and therefore you can't, you can't report real success to those folks who are monitoring your progress. Remember there are multiple actors and make sure you affect multiple actors when you're um, designing your strategies. So I, I learned this lesson really well when I was doing a project for the Commonwealth of Massachusetts a number of years ago and we had a blue ribbon panel sitting around the table trying to figure out what programs we should, we should be moving forward next. And the, this is at the state level and I watched as people um, suggested programs and program after program was making the hauler responsible for, for everything. Oh, the hauler should be required to do this. The hauler should be required to report that. The hauler should be required to do X, Y, Z. And I watched the haulers sort of sink lower and lower in their chairs. I think it's very, you know, it's 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 difficult to say that one actor should be responsible for a whole sector or take the burden of that. Also, the haulers have the difficult situation of of their job, their, the job they perceive, and and rightly so, I'd say, is that their job is to make their clients happy and to serve their clients, and their clients are you know, people who want their trash taken away. And um, if, you, if you burden them with things like, gee, and I have to report you to the, to the city now because you have things that are bad in your, in your recycling bin, is that the hauler's job? Maybe it is, but you need to think about dividing the responsibility, the burden, and, and sort of the partnerships among a variety of actors, not merely the haulers. 
Now there's that any information or or advice you're going to give, make sure you know it's going to be a lot better received if it's peer to peer, um, and not a generalist or a or a sort of a, a planner talking to an industrial location. If you're going to have authority and and new programs, you need to have both enforcement and funding, and those are those are really important. And that's that's those are um, a, authority without enforcement is a pretty meaningless thing. We made sure that we um, think about mandates so that we can get some real bang for the buck and also measurement and reporting strategies to find out what is success and have we reached it. For for this particular community, they, they were desperate to reach a recycling goal of 75% and they were only at 35% right now. So we crafted a variety of um, strategies that included, yes, outreach and grant program, included the differential um, tip fee surcharge that we talked about, 150% of recycling required to be embedded in the trash bill, so a pay-as-you-throw system with 150% requirement. Required recycling organics diversion for the major sectors, and I showed you some of those major sectors that were the, the producers of, of, the, of the material. We had some step taller incentives. A landfill ban for some of the key recyclables that, that were the big tons. And then we instituted tracking, and particularly we instituted that um, percent recoverables uh, remaining, or percent um, recoverables remaining um, metric with some interim checks and decision points to say okay we're going to check in two years to see which of these are or are not really on the ground and if not put you know put extra attention on it or bring forward something that that might be able to be implemented more easily to make sure that the community could move from their 35 percent to 55 percent to the ultimate goal of 75 percent um, that kind of a strategy um, where can can help move uh, can can help make a package of things that make recycling perform. And we looked at the county costs to figure out the full-time equivalent labor and the, uh, the other kinds of costs to make sure that those could be afforded by the, by the county. Um, I did want to talk a, a moment about food waste and say that we um, there's a report that we issued for the um, EPA Region 5. It's found at foodscrapsrecovery.org. And it talks about what are some typical programs and best management practices for commercial food waste. It wasn't really the focus of today's talk, but um, we that that report has startup information, uh, frequency, um, how to sell the programs, and sort of where some of that um, food waste is most generated um, and where it's collected um, at the current time. Should you look at the commercial sector? I would say yes. It, it's it's important. Is it worth it? It's a large percent of the waste stream. You can get big increments in tons per per participant, and it's sort of part of that larger picture of moving moving things forward. There are tools and resources out there. Um, uh, we we use a model that we use to try to figure out what are the the most of, of appropriate programs for a particular community. You can, we have a waste comp proxy model, but it's something that you could also derived based on the information I talked about um, in the literature. Um, when you're doing commercial rates modeling work, you look at adjustments to um, who's subscribing to what and what that means for service and rates, and that's something that's valuable. But there are loads and loads of publications that give you information on waste comps, on, um, on uh, tons per employee, on programs that can really make sense. And you can find um, some of those under our name and many other folks as well. In summary, I think it's really important to understand the sector, but don't let the the activities that you might have to do a survey or others, you know, stop you. It's no mystery. You could get a, a long way along the road of assuming, gosh, there are a lot of offices in town. We could hit paper. There are a lot of you know shippers who deal with cardboard, things like that. You can look at uh, reports from other places. The barriers are not just the usual suspects. Don't throw up your hands and say, oh gosh. Um, we can't deal with it because of cost. Well, you can deal with some things like the invoicing problem that I mentioned um, and the invoicing and contract issues and try to make it so that people are in, businesses are informed that if they get, you know, if they've let something become evergreen and just keep rolling over with a with a standard cost increase every year, they might be able to do better by rebidding and, and getting right sized service. Um, there are lots of workable options. I've talked a lot about um, the, the level of control anywhere from education up to mandates. And that, frankly, commercial sector is sort of in evolution. It's the next step. Thank you. 
And I did want to thank people for filling out the surveys that help us support analyses like these. So if any of you folks are out there um, have filled those out, we really appreciate it. It helps us be able to do quantitative work. I'm done, Wayne. Questions? Okay, thank you, Lisa, uh, for that great presentation. So we're going to spend a couple minutes here. We have a couple questions from our audience, but if you do have a question, uh, please use the go to webinar dialog box. So uh, let's go to the questions here. Uh, Lisa, I, I think one of the beginning slides, you mentioned the job creation ratio of 10 to 4 to 1. Could you explain that in a little more detail? Happy to. So the, that information comes from the Institute for, Lo for Local Self-Reliance, and what it says is that um, if you're trying to come up with some, some broad, broad numbers, 10,000 tons um, at a landfill means one job. That's the far right. 10,000 tons in, oh gosh, is it recycling is four jobs, and, and in composting is 10 jobs. I think it's the other way around. I think that 10,000 tons is... Um, you can look on ISLR. I'm drawing a blank right now, but it's um, recycling, comp it's landfilling, recycling, composting, or land landfilling, composting, recycling. So okay. if you can move those tons from one stream to another, you get net jobs created. Okay. What are the best sources for estimating greenhouse gas emission reductions from recycling and reuse? I think you might have mentioned that later on in the presentation. For standard recyclables, it's pretty easy. We just we if we have just a sort of regular budget project we and and we're talking about traditional recyclables we go to the um epa's um um warm model uh model thank you warm model thank you um the warm model and run it through with say 100 tons um landfill that become now 100 tons traditional recycling mix um you can it also has uh if and then look at the difference in the output for how many how many greenhouse gas metric tons of carbon equivalent or carbon dioxide equivalent or um, the BTUs that come out of the model. So that gives you a really easy indicator. But material by material, you can also do by doing something very similar. You know, take one ton, it would have been landfilled, and now it's now it's aluminum that's that's recycled and, and that sort of thing. Um, there's um, that's pretty easy. I know that there the numbers for composting and food waste are not as not not universally happily received, and so I think that that takes a little bit more more machination and look, more looking at the literature for those particular materials. But for traditional recyclables, it's a pretty easy source of greenhouse gas factors. Okay, thank you. Okay, when business is right size, I guess that assumes the, that means recycling, what's the best way to ensure that the savings they get are recognized in that business's budget process? Um, I guess the question is what, it, um, if it's if they right size, um, their if they if the new if their current hauler isn't going to give them a, a change in price that reflects that, then I would go to a, a a bid situation and say, what would you offer me until I find a, a bid that helps me save save more money. As far as whether or not it they retain it in their cost center, that I can't that I can't say. That's really business procedures and. Um, and if if um, it goes to a, a central budget as opposed to the local budget for that franchise or that business or whatever, I, that that I can't solve. Um, but I I don't I hope I've answered the question. Okay. Uh, won't businesses usually save money if they eliminate wasteful practices and set up reusable shipping containers and reusable pallets, for example? Recycling may also save money if rates are structured correctly. Um, well, it, let's start with if rates are structured correctly. Uh, um, it, I wouldn't if they're structured the way that I think they, that in an incentive-based way, as I described with pay as you throw. Then yes, businesses should should um, save money if they recycle more under that new system. Um, moving to that new system may or may not save them money, but within that system, they'll save money by recycling more. <clears throat> Absolutely, the, fir the, the first steps in right sizing might be bringing in a technical advisor and going to things like you know waste reduction procedures, reuse, shipping in 
containers that make more sense within the within the business and so on, and then figure out the right sizing and then get the bids. And you, I, I, I can't imagine a situation which that wouldn't be beneficial to to a business to do. Um, that that seems pretty straightforward. Okay, for the cooperative cooperative recycling programs you mentioned, uh, is there a typical uh, entity who ends up coordinating the program, such as a business improvement district or a city or a chamber of commerce? I've seen um, it fall in the desks of city staff. I've seen it fall in the desks of nonprofits who've set that up, sometimes with assistance by um, the city. And there's absolutely no reason business improvement districts couldn't help with that. It's, it's more labor intensive than it is anything, just getting that initially set up and so on. Right. Here's a, a comment uh, from uh, Georgia. Uh, they've uh, implemented a commercial recycling ordinance and policy requiring single stream recycling, collection, education, one-time report element. And the one tool they developed was to help with frequent space complaints, especially for multifamily, uh, eight yard dumpsters and looking at lids and vertical plates to provide four yard, cubic yard trash, four yard recycling. So basically, they they've addressed some issues with implementing oh. uh, a mandated program. That sounds that sounds great. I'd be really interested to hear how that how that performs. But you know, single stream was such a boon to to making recycling in the commercial sector so much more feasible in in for um, businesses that are you know in in a in a business district. You know, it may not it's it's harder for them to to think about. Con Separating into multiple streams, if it can be trash and recycling, I think that's easier for the folks who are, who are um, in the both in operations and in the space issue. I should mention one thing about space, and I know that people get concerned that there's no space for recycling, but there's almost always space in there for multiple 96-gallon containers, and that may only be that may be what some businesses can get by with, and so it may not be a space and screening um, issue in all cases. Maybe you don't have the footprint for a for a dumpster or the access for a dumpster. But very often you have a footprint or space for a, for a couple of 96s. Okay. All right. We're just about out of time, but I'm going to just give you one uh, quick tip here from one of our attendees. Download the more model now in case it's not always there in the future. That's <gasps> oh, deep, my deep. gosh. Of course. <laughs> it's funny, but it's not. That's a really great <laughs> tip. Yes. Thank you for that. Okay. So, we're uh, here. Yeah. We're uh, we're out of time, so we're going to end the webinar now. So so thanks again, Lisa, for uh, presenting this great uh, this great topic, and thank you for all the attendees for joining us. And we hope you'll join us for next month's webinar. Uh, please visit the NRC and RMC websites for the, uh, the webinar recordings, and then for any schedule updates. So have a great day, everybody, and and thanks again, Lisa, and thanks again, the attendees. Thank you. It's been a pleasure.